we are going to speak uh, we are going to speak about index calculus algorithm. So first, I will give you some general overview of the kind of framework we are working with, and then uh, we will try to dive inside uh, this kind of, uh, of stuff with with some not too complicated examples to start with. Okay. So index calculus algorithms. Uh, uh, so we are working with a group, but this time we know more about the group. So we have something uh, about, we not only know how to, to compute the group operation, but we know something about the structure of the group. <coughs> and in these structures, there is something about the group that tells us, okay, all, not all elements in the group are equal. Some of them seem nicer. And these are going to be what I will call small elements in the group. So the first thing you do in index calculus, one of the first things, uh, sometimes you need to choose the best way to represent your group before doing that. But once you have a good way to represent your group, uh, what you do uh, in one of the first steps is to choose a subset of elements which are nice and considered to be small. Okay, so this will be uh, called, uh, it depends on the, on the people, so it can be called either the smoothness basis or the factor basis or whatever. So if you hear me speaking about one of those, it will be in fact all the same thing, and it will be this small subset, well, this subset of small elements, and the subset itself is not going to be too large, so it's also going to be relatively small compared to, to the full size of the group. Okay. So once I have this, uh, this, this, this uh, set, what we are going to look for is Multiplicative relations. So remember, we have a group where everything is multiplicative, so it's reasonable to search for something which is multiplicative. And what we call a multiplicative relation is just a sequence of many elements from this small subset together with some exponents, which, which could be either positive or negative. And what we want is a product of all these elements raised to their respective powers to be equal to 1. Okay? So we want a way to generate multiplicative relation of this form. And in general, in index calculus algorithm, the number of elements that appear here in the relation is going to be relatively small. Okay? So these relations are going to be sparse. Okay? So once you have such a relation, if you know that is, the group is cyclic, and you have a generator, you can at least mentally take log of the equation. We don't know how to compute logs. That's what we want to do. But if you are just a mathematician and you don't care about whether you can compute this stuff, you can still put a log in front of the number. So let's do that. So if you do that, this is going to become a sum of exponents times the logs of the small values equal to zero. OK? And the trick of index calculus is to say, well, this is giving me some information about the logs. In fact, this is giving me a linear equation among the, logarithmic, the, the, the logarithms of the elements. Okay, so if you consider the logs of your small element to be just unknowns in a linear system of equations, if you can collect enough equation of this form, then you have hope to solve the linear system and learn these logarithms. Okay? And this is precisely what we are going to do when we do index calculus. And of course, since all the logs are defined modulo the order of the group, <coughs> this linear system is going to be modulo the order of the group. Okay? And this is really the core of all index calculus algorithm. Find sparse multiplicative relation, apply formally a log to it, transform it into a sparse linear equation, and then, once you have enough of those, try to solve the resulting system. Okay? So one thing I won't go into detail, well, at least not now, maybe later if we have some more time, is how do we do the linear algebra? So everybody knows that linear algebra is easy. You have done that since you were... Uh, I don't know, first year undergraduate student, so everybody knows linear algebra is very easy. Okay, uh, except that here we are dealing with huge systems. So if you try to do linear algebra in the regular way of 
I don't know, Gaussian pi, pi voting, for example, uh, then there will be, you will encounter some trouble. Because if you start with a huge matrix, which is almost empty, well, if you want to write the full matrix in memory, it's completely stupid. You are going to have zeros everywhere, and the matrix will not fit. So we, you will write it in sparse form, saying, OK, the non-zero elements are in these coordinates, and here are the values. But if, once you start doing pivoting, well, the sparsity is going to become lower and lower and lower, and your matrix representation is going to explode. And very quickly, you won't be even able to store the matrix in memory if, it, if the dimension was large enough, were well, large enough to begin with. So, well, this is a problem. And in fact, for many index calculus algorithms, you, you can deal with systems where the dimension of the matrices are up to dozens of millions. And if you want to store a full matrix of this form in your memory, it probably won't fit. Okay? And moreover, uh, very often we are collecting more equations than unknown, so we have a rectangular matrix, matrix, so the situation is becoming even worse. So, okay, so there is something there. And if, if there is time, I might speak about that a, uh, later during the week. Um, it's something very interesting, but it's not within the core of what I want to present, so that's why I will just skip it. But uh, remember, there is this problem with linear, with linear algebra. So in fact, the trick is, since the system are sparse, there are, system, there are techniques coming from <coughs> numerical analysis, essentially, uh, that allows us to solve this linear system using a very strange, strange trick. In order to find solutions to such systems, instead of working on the matrix, we are just going to work on vectors. And the only operation we are going to apply using the matrix are matrix vector multiplication. And if you do it in a nice way, you will, will be able to find a solution to the linear system. Okay? You will not have this explosion of the coefficient. And moreover, since you are only doing matrix vector multiplication and you are not doing too many of them, the cost of the linear algebra is essentially going to be quadratic in the dimension instead of cubic. So it's really really a nice approach with nice property, but of course it gives you this good performance <coughs> only if the system is, is sparse. As the system becomes denser and denser, the cost of multiplying one vector by the matrix becomes higher and there is less interest to do that. Okay, but let's store this somewhere away and remember that there is some linear algebra, that in principle linear algebra is easy, but in practice uh, you need to take care. Okay, and at the very end, there will be something uh, that we discussed with, with Nadia this morning, uh, which I call the individual logarithm phase. Uh, what, happens, uh, what happens at the end? If you remember what I just said, after writing enough equation, doing linear algebra, what I'm going to learn are these, the value of these unknowns. So these are logs of elements of the small subset. But when you do that, you are not finished. Because computing discrete logs in a group means that you can take any arbitrary element in the group and find its discrete log. And right now, I am just getting the logs of some specific elements. So at the end, once I, I have the log of these specific elements, I need to do some further stuff to get the log <laughs> of any arbitrary element in the group. Okay? And this is called the individual logarithm phase. And for many index calculus algorithms, this is in fact much more efficient than what we did before. It's much, much easier to compute one discrete individual logarithm uh, than to, to do all the relation collection on the linear algebra set. So if you do this pre-computation, after that, this is not going to be too costly, at least for some algorithm. We'll see that for some newer, it, the situation is a bit different. Okay. So let's get an historical view of how it looked <coughs> for index calculus algorithm uh, well, at the end of 2012, essentially. So at the end of 2012, uh, all the index calculus algorithm for finite fields, so there are some other for, for specific elliptic curves and this kind of thing, but right now let's focus on finite fields. So the complexity of this algorithm for finite field was of the form LQ, where Q is the size of the finite field you are considering, 
of beta on C. Okay? And this formula stands for exponential of C. Well, if you want to hide the little o of 1 of the complexity, you put it there. If you want to be more formal, you put it later in the C plus little o of 1. It really depends. Okay, so but it's exponential of C times log Q to the beta times log log Q to the 1 minus beta. Okay. So this function, you have the size of the finite field as input, and then you have these two parameters, C and beta. Well, the most important parameter here is beta. Why? Well, let's take beta B, B1. If beta is equal to 1, you see that uh, log log Q is going to vanish. And you will have just exponential of constant time log Q, which will be Q to the C. Well, we know how to get this kind of complexity using generic algorithms. So the generic algorithms we saw yesterday have complexity square root of the size of the group. So here it would be square root of Q, or square root of the largest prime factor of Q, but okay, uh, of Q minus 1, sorry. Uh, but uh, so it would, it's going to be something like Q to the 1 half. So it's going to be. LQ of uh, 1 and 1. Okay? If we could have beta very small, if we could have beta equal 0, uh, that would essentially be exponential of log log Q times C. So it would be log log, it would be log Q to the power C. So this would be, if we, you could have beta equal 0 and forget about the little o of 1, it would be a polynomial time algorithm. Okay, so beta controls the growth bet between a, a polynomial time algorithm and a fully exponential algorithm. And if you set the cursor somewhere in between, then you, are, you will have some algorithm wh whose complexity is going to be called sub-exponential. That's the word we usually use for this complexity. And as we will, uh, we will see, there are two big kinds of index calculus algorithms, they are the, the provable one, where you can really show that everything is fine, and the heuristic one, where, okay, if we assume that this and that, it's going to be okay. Um, usually we use the second kind because they are more efficient. Uh, but if you want the, the, the rigorous one, the one you can really prove, we are going to have complexity with a one half as uh, for beta. Okay, so it's going to be exponential of square root of log q times log log q with some constant in front of it. And if you accept heuristic algorithm, what you are going to have are algorithms with complexity with a one cell. And we will see, we will see example of that the, uh, during the talk. Um, but there was something very strange for the complexity when you look at at all the finite fields, you can, so if you look at discrete logs and if you look at all the finite fields, there is a funny situation is that we have three separate, very different zones. Okay? And this zone depends uh, on the way the size of the finite field is balanced between the base <coughs> field, the characteristic, and the exponent. Okay? So if the characteristic is very small, we are in this zone. So this is the case, for example, if you look at finite fields of characteristic 2 or 3. So if you look at the field gf of 2 to the p or 3 to the p or something like this, you are going to be in this zone. If you look on the other hand at the prime fields uh, you often encounter in, uh, in, in applications, you are going to be in that zone. Okay? And for both extremes, we are going to use slightly different algorithms, which are, which are siblings, but which are different. And in the middle, something very strange happens. Okay, if, if p goes down, but the exponent goes up to keep the, the size of the finite field roughly constant, <coughs> uh, at some point, it's going to be, become more difficult. So it's really strange because you have this, this situation with, uh, with this. It almost looked like an Olympic podium or something, but uh, we, we don't know why exactly. Well, we know why, but, but, but it doesn't seem very natural to have this. Okay. Uh, so what you, what you might, might ask is, okay, are these constants here very important, and what do they mean? So they are not very important, 
Because anyway, the constants that you have here are not the best constant so that you, we have now for the yellow of one cells algorithm. Uh, but but they are, still they have some meaning. So one question here is assume that you want, you, you have a complexity for a group, which is this, given by this L of one third with such a constant, and another L of one third with another constant, and you know that this constant is cube root of something, and this one is cube root of twice the same thing. What does it mean if you are a designer and want to select parameters? Okay, well, it doesn't mean anything because there is this little O of 1, so there are lots of hidden uh, practical constant. But let's look at what is going to happen asymptotically. And asymptotically, what is going to happen is that to get the same security here and there, you are going to have to select a field with twice as many bits. So this 2 under the cube root is really a 2. Uh, you should ignore the cube root and look at the inner, the inner value of the constant. So why is that? Well, just, just uh, double the bit size. It means you are going to square the value of Q, or you are going to double the log. What is going to happen on the log log is essentially nothing. Because log, well, OK, log, log of, of 2 log Q is just log log Q plus a little something that you can ignore. Okay, so you can ignore <coughs> the action of the two on the, on the right. And so there will be a, a, a two to the beta coming out of the formula. And that's it. That's exactly the two to the one third since beta is equal to one third. So, so these constants are still important. Okay? Uh, and basically, uh, that's that was my introduction, I think. And uh, I need now to, I want now to move to some <coughs> more specific algorithms in this, uh, in this field. So I will first show you something which is not in my slide, and the, but it's still quite important. It's one of the first index calculus algorithms. It is something we can prove. So since we can prove it, it's going to be a complexity of L of 1 half, and it's something quite nice. Okay, and it even works for factoring. So it works for discrete log in big prime fields, and it also works for, for factoring. So I'm not going to look into the details of the individual logarithm for now. I'm just going to look at the first step of the, of the, of, uh, of the index calculus part. So I'm going to select a, a smoothness, uh, smoothness basis or a factor basis, and I'm going to find it relations, and we'll see what happens. Okay? So, uh, what I'm going to do is I start with my prime p. That's fine. And I want to find relation mod p. And to find relation mod p, uh, I'm, I'm going to, to want to have multiplicative relations. So I'm going to have elements that decompose into product of stuff. Um, okay, so if you have an element, try to see whether it decomposes into a product. When is that easy? Well, it's easy to factor a number when the factors are small. So one very natural thing to look at is to select for my uh, factor base a set of small elements. Okay, and since you know that everything can be, f if you factor to small elements, you can even factor the small element un until you have primes factor. So what you are going to select is a subset P, is a subset S of, of values L prime and L smaller than some bound B. Okay, so you take all the primes smaller than some bound. And we are going to try to find relation involving these small primes. Okay, so I, how can, you, can we do that? Okay. So the first thing you can do, with, which is a bit... Uh, it's stupid, maybe, but, but it's still going to give you something interesting, is the following. OK, among these primes, there is one specific one that I'm going to look at. It's 2. So look at 2. This is a nice prime. OK, and if you, 
select a random number x modulo p minus 1, you can easily compute 2 to the x mod p. Okay? So 2 to the x mod p is going to be a number. This is fine. And it's going to be, well, you can always normalize it to belong to the range minus p over 2, p over 2. Well, you could say it's between 0 and p, but it's slightly better to do that. Okay, if you do that, there will be some sign. So you need to add minus 1 to the set of elements, just to make sure that you can write things. But okay, it's not very important. So you are going to take 2 to the x and write it that way. Okay? Once you have done that, what is going to happen? Okay, you have some element. So I should give it a name, so A, this representation of 2 to the x. And my question is, is it possible, is it possible to write A as a product of small primes, <coughs> all belonging to the set S? Okay. So what I claim is that if you can do that, there will not be many primes in the decomposition. At most, there will be log of p primes in the decomposition. Because, uh, well, if you multiply more than that, you will get numbers which are going to be too big. Okay? So if you just take a, a number like this, and you are lucky, Okay, if you are lucky, then you get an equation, 2 to the x equal mod p. Well, on dividing by 2 to the x, you get exactly a relation as I had on my first slide. The only difference between what I had on my, in my first slide is that this number is going to be large. In the first slide, I told you, OK, all the exponents are small. In this first example, these exponents here are large. But this is not a real problem. Okay? Having, one in, having a sparse matrix of exponents and one additional large column is not really a problem for the linear algebra. So it's going to be OK. OK, so if I, ca if I can find enough relation of this form, then I will write down my linear system, solve for the logs, and I will be done. So the key question is, what is the probability for a random number in this interval <coughs> to, be, uh, to be smooth, to be decomposable into a product of primes smaller than x? And this question is something which has been studied uh, by serious mathematicians. I'm not going to give you the full theorem because it's a pen to write down. But it's something which is called the theorem of Canfield, Erdosh, and Pomeranz. <coughs> okay, and this gives you uh, the, the, this probability. So the simplified version of the theorem which ignore a few little things. Uh, when, when, when you write the full theorem, you should say, OK, the bound is not too small compared to the prime, or neither is it too close to the prime. Or, well, but forget about this. Okay, if you just forget about this, what I get is a random number in some range. I have a smoothness bound. And I ask, what is the probability for a random number between 0 and x? So I have a random number in this <laughs> interval, and I ask what is the probability that this is B smooth. So that this factor with all factors. So random number in this, and probability to factor uh, with all factors smaller than B. So this is the thing I want. Okay? 
And essentially, if you forget about the little technicalities, uh, what the theorem of confidence and performance is saying is that this probability, uh, we can give a good approximation to it. And in fact, the logarithm of the probability, well, I will put a minus in front of it because it's more convenient than it will be a, a number bigger than one. So the opposite of the logarithm of the probability is essentially, well, it's close to logarithm of x divided by logarithm of b. And there is a correction factor. It's not exactly that. There is a, corrector fa a correction factor, which is the logarithm of the same thing. OK? And this I'm going to use all the time whenever I will have to do a complexity analysis of this. Of this. <coughs> so this you want to write somewhere and remember. The logarithm of the probability is the logarithm of the bound divided by the logarithm of the smoothness bound times the logarithm of the same thing. Okay? okay? And now that we know that, I'm going to look at what is the complexity of this algorithm if we select optimal parameters. So what, do, what does it mean selecting optimal parameters? It means, okay, I'm going to select this bound B. Anyway, it's the only parameter I have there. All the rest is fixed. So I'm going to select this bound B in such a way that the overall complexity is minimal for the full algorithm. So what is going to be the cost of the overall complexity? Well, there are two phases in what I am doing. One of the phases is finding enough relation. And the other phase is, uh, once you have enough relation, doing the linear algebra. So we are going to look at the sum of the <coughs> two complexity, and we are going to try to minimize this. OK? And to simpl simplify things, uh, at some point, I will, I will tell you, OK, the complexity of this phase is is something complicated, but I'm going to give an upper bound because it will be enough for the analysis. Okay? So just remember Confiler dos Pomerans. I'm going to, to erase the board. Remember the kind of relation I am looking for. And, uh, and we are going to try to do this analysis right now to see what we, what we find. OK. So the first question we need to ask ourselves is, well, how big is our smoothness basis? Because the size of the smoothness basis is going to tell us the number of relations we need. We need enough for the linear algebra system to have full run. And uh, it will also tell us uh, the number, the, the cost of the linear system. <coughs> once you have a square matrix, it will be of dimension size of S plus a little something maybe, and that will give us the complexity. Okay, so we know that, the, in fact, the complexity of the linear algebra, I just told you before, is going to be essentially the square of the size of S. But, well, computing the size of S is a mess. It's a number of prime smaller than B. Essentially, it's going to be B over log B, but we don't care. We, just, we are just going to say that the complexity of the linear algebra is going to be bounded by B squared. At most, there are B elements in this, in this set. So the complexity of the linear algebra, since it's essentially quadratic, is going to be bounded by B squared. OK? In fact, there are other parameters, but they are negligible, and they just compensate the log, the log B. So just forget about that. OK. And then, how much is the relation collection phase going to cost? So I'm going to take random value for x and look at the numbers that come out and look whether they factor into the they factor nicely. So you might tell me, well, wait a minute. If you want to see if this number factor nicely, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you the price of factoring these numbers. Well, that's both true and false. OK, it's true. You need to factor the numbers. But since you need to factor only numbers who have small factors, then you can do something to factor them that is essentially going to be negligible compared to the, to the rest of the cost of the algorithm. In fact, if you use, uh, if you use ECM 
to, to factors or small numbers, uh, the cost of this factoring is going to be very cheap, asymptotically. And in practice, we are going to do something even better. We are going to, we are going to in practical algorithms, which are not going to be this one, but we are going to use seeding approach that I will discuss later. And this will be very efficient either. So we can uh, push the cost of factoring under the rug and don't look at it. Say, OK, factoring is as a unit cost for the relation we want. And it will be true in practice. It will be true both in practice and in theory. Uh, so I can ignore the, the cost of factoring. But, but what I cannot ignore is the probability that a given element is going to be, to be good. So the number of elements I, I need to pick, I need to try. So I need to try and I need to do n trials where n times the probability is going to be close to b. OK, I, need, I want b relations, or b plus uh, 1,000 or whatever. OK, so how many things do I need to try? I need to try b over probability of smoothness, OK? With the probability coming from confield Erdos Pomerance. OK, so this is going to be the cost of the, of the algorithm. So now that you know that, uh, you, want to, you want to optimize, you want to choose B to make sure that this is minimized. OK. So if you are not careful, you might tell me, well, uh, B is only up there, so you should select the smallest possible value for B. But this is forgetting the fact that the probability depends on B. So if you remember that the probability depends on B, things are going to change. So the fact that the probability depends on B, so what, what was it? It was, uh, it was uh, minus log of the probability equal log P over log B times the logarithm of the steps. OK? So uh, since I don't want to be uh, to make my analysis too complicated, uh, I will just assume something for, for now. And anyway, if, even if my assumption is wrong, what I'm going to get is a, an upper bound on the running time. So it, it would be fine for, for our purpose. So what I'm going to assume is that the best thing I can do is to make sure that the cost of this part and the cost of this part are essentially equal. Okay, because uh, well, you you can see if the cost of, of the linear algebra is way too, is way bigger than the cost of this, by reducing the size of b, you are going to require a little more time to find relation, but the linear algebra will be faster, and clearly you will you will only get. Okay, and uh, in the reverse direction, you have the same kind of things. So in fact, the best thing we can do is to balance the two phases. But balances, uh, balancing the two phases means that you want to have an equality between B and the inverse of the probability. So it means we want. 1 over the probability roughly equal to b. So take logs. And what do we find? We find that we want log p over log b times log of log p over log b. Uh, I said something and wrote exactly the reverse. Log p over log b. We want this to be equal to log b. <coughs> OK. So how, how do you solve that? Well, one thing you might say, OK, is, uh, well, you want this to be approximately equal. So you might say, OK, I'm just going to multiply by log b. So it tells me that log b should be roughly square root of that. But there is some log b in there, okay, which is a mess. <coughs> but if you do it in a two-step process, you do it 
first, one first time and then substitute B by this first approximation and do it, uh, do it again, you find that the nice thing you to do is to have log B to be of the form some constant alpha times square root of log P log log P. Okay, and now we just need to solve for the constant alpha. So let's do that. So when, when you solve for this, what do you find? Uh, you find here, so log B is going to be alpha square root of log P log log P. Okay. Here, what, what are you going to get? You are going to get log p divided by square root of log p log log p. So you are going to get log p over log log p to the power <coughs> 1 half time 1 over alpha. Okay, and then there is a log of the same thing. But the log of the same thing, the same kind of trick that I had before is going to apply. Taking the logarithm of this is essentially going to be log log p because the log of this, of, you know, you will have log log p plus <laughs> log 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 p, which is going to be negligible. So this is essentially going to be log log p, except that there is a square root, which is going to come out. So here is what, we, here, here is what you get. You see that you have the square root of log p log log p on this side, the square root of log p log log p on this side. You just cancel them out. And you find that you want 1 over alpha, well, 1 over 2 alpha to be equal to alpha. Which means that alpha should be square root of 2 over 2. And now, if you push it here, what is going to be the complexity of this? It is going to be the complexity of this plus this. Since both are going to be equal, the complete complexity is going to be b squared. Okay, so it's going to be twice. The log of the complexity is going to be twice that. So you are going to find that the complexity is simply LP of 1 half and square root of 2. Okay? And this algorithm is very nice because you, you have no crazy heuristic assumption about things because all the numbers we are picking are really random numbers mod p since the exponents are random. So the way we are constructing relation is completely conforming to the confiler dos theorem and there is nothing wrong when doing this. Okay? So in fact you can do better than that and when, if you want to do better than that with L, L of one half algorithms so what you want to do is to make this constant square root of two go down. But I'm not going to do that now. This was just to give you one example of what you can do with a very, very basic uh, algorithm. <coughs> okay? So this is my first simple example of index calculus. Um, now I will try to go to, to something a little more complex. But to go to something more complex, uh, if, I, if I stay in the finite field GFP, it's really going to be a mess because I'm going to go for the number field sieve, so I'm going to be able to need to use complicated objects. And these complicated objects, you probably don't want to hear about them right now. So instead of doing that, I'm going to go to the other part of the, of the diagram, and I'm going to work with objects which, which are algebraically easier to, 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 to see. Um, you, you will probably get a better idea of the kind of things I want to do. Okay. So what I'm going to show you now is a, a logarithm for discrete logarithm, uh, an algorithm for discrete logarithms in finite field of quite small characteristic. And it's a simplified version of the function field sieve. Because if I presented you the full function field sieve as was invented historically, it still would be a mess. Not as complicated as the number field sieve, but still complicated. So we want something as simple as possible. So we are going to use this algorithm, which I designed with Renal Lercier in 2006. And uh, the first thing we need 
is we need to find a way to work with the finite field f of p to the q. So what you probably all know is that given a, uh, well, finite fields, you probably all know that their cardinality are always powers of primes. Okay, so nothing else is, is possible for a finite field. And you probably also know that given a fixed cardinality, there is a single finite field. There are not hundreds of ways, there is a single one. But despite this fact that there is a single finite field, there are many different ways to represent it. So the can canonical way to do that is usually to take uh, polynomials over the base field fp and then look at this polynomial modulo some irreducible of the correct degree of the degree k. And this gives you a representation of the finite field. Okay? But at least the choice of this polynomial is completely arbitra arbitrary. You can do whatever you want. So we are going to choose a polynomial that is going to be convenient for us. Okay. So, and we are not going to choose it directly. We are going to go through some crazy process to choose the polynomial. And you will see after, after a little while why we are doing it. So what we do first is we select, we select two polynomials f1 and f2 uh, of relatively low degree. So this polynomial will have degree d1 and d2. And what we, we request is that the product d1 times d2 should be bigger <coughs> than k. Okay? Once you have done that, you add another condition. You ask for this polynomial, f1 of f2 of x <coughs> minus x. Well, it's the opposite of what is on the board. For your irreducibility, taking the opposite doesn't really matter. So you so you ask for this polynomial to have an irreducible factor of degree k modulo the prime p. So is this a likely event, by the way? Has anyone a clue if I take a random polynomial of degree n, where n is slightly <coughs> bigger than k, what is the probability that this polynomial has a factor of an irreducible factor of degree exactly k? At least assuming that the finite field is large enough and just forgetting about low order factors. Does anyone have a clue? Yeah? I think it's more that it's related to this kind of formula. Um, no. What is related to this is the probability that something split into many small degree factors. But here I am asking exactly the contrary. You are Tom taking something big and you asked for it to be irreducible. So it's essentially the, the same question as picking a random number and asking what is the probability to be, for it to be prime. You know that the probability for a random number to be prime is essentially uh, 1 over the log of its size. OK? And here we have something similar. Except that for polynomials, you don't take log. You just look at the degrees. So essentially, if you take a random polynomial of degree k over a finite field, the probability that it is uh, irreducible is very close to 1 over k. I say very close because it's not exactly that. And for very small finite field, there is a, a significant uh, different, difference. So if you take polynomial over gf2, the probability are going to be different. But if you take polynomial over gf of 1001, then uh, everything will be, will be OK. OK, so the probability to have for polynomial of degree k to, have, uh, to be irreducible is 1 over k. And in fact, the probability for a polynomial of degree between k plus 1 and 2k minus 1 to have an irreducible factor of degree k is again 1 over k, or very close. OK, so this kind of event is going to happen very quickly. Just take a few, a couple of polynomials, and very, very quickly, you will get an irreducible factor of the right size. OK, so we find a representation of, of our finite field. So why do I insist on this, kind, of this representation? Because in some sense, we are de when doing that, we are defining the finite field implicitly by requesting a finite field of degree k over gfp such that contains two elements x and y related by two low degree uh, polynomial relations. So we are constructing the finite field in such a way that in the finite field there will be two elements x and y 
such that x is going to be f1 of y and y is going to be f2 of x. Why is that? Well, you know that in my finite field, the element x, any element x should be equal to itself. Wow. So you know that x should be f1 of f2 of x. OK, but since x is a root of the factor of degree k of this, magically this happens. So we are really happy. And you just define y as the other one. And y will be a solution of y minus f2 of f1 of y, which will also contain a redu an irreducible factor of degree k. OK, so we are building the finite field in such a way that we have two elements in this finite field which are related by these low degree relations. OK, so far, so good? Fine for everyone? OK, so what am I, am I going to do with that? So from this, I am going to build something which is essential in in all modern index <coughs> calculus algorithm, I'm going to draw a commutative diagram. That we, yes? So, why do you say no degree? I'm confused now. You just say that those are no degree for this uh, polynomial, right? But k is. Uh, well, k is the extension degree. Right. But if you look at d1 and d2, the only thing you ask is d1 and d2 to have their product bigger than k. So essentially, compared to k, you, you could hope both of them to be. Open square root of k. So the square root of k is small com compared to k. Okay. Okay? So that's what I mean by small here. Small compared to k, essentially. I have a secret of really dumb questions. Yeah. Can we go back on some? One side here. So when you say that x minus f1, f2, x has an irreducible factor, you're saying it is irreducible? No, because it could be strictly bigger. If, if k is 17 mm -hmm. and uh, d1 and <coughs> d2 are 4 and 5, well, okay, so. Okay. And then you're using this problem, x minus. So I am using, to define my finite field, I am using the, redu the reducible factor of the co of degree k. But still, even if it's a factor of the big one, the, these relation will be satisfied. Okay? So that's uh, OK. Clear for everyone? OK, so now I'm going to move to this commutative diagram. So it's so important that I'm probably going to draw it again and comment it. Okay, so, because it's really something you, whenever you do index calculus, you want to, to look at these, uh, at these commutative diagrams. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start from bivariate polynomial in the two unknowns, big X and big Y. OK? So let's take this. And uh, OK. First thing you can do is replace X and Y by their value in the finite field, by little x and little y. And if you do this, well, you obtain an element of the finite field, f of p to the little k, so f of p to the k. OK. But well, this is plain stupid. It's just a way of generating elements in the finite field. And there is not much to do with it. So instead, we are going to, to take two different routes to, to do this full transform. And I say, OK, when I replace x and y by their value to get down to the finite field, I can do it progressively. <coughs> Instead of replacing both of them at once, well, what I could do is first say, OK, remember in the finite field, there is some relation between x and y. In fact, y is going to be, was it f1 of x or f2? I don't remember. I'm not sure it's consistent between my two slides. Uh, x was f, f1 of uh, y, so yes, y is f2 of x, so this is consistent. So what you can do is replace y by f2 of x. 
Okay, since the relation holds in the finite field, doing this is not going to mess up everything. Okay, and if you do that, you just obtain a, a univariate polynomial in X. And you know that if in this univariate polynomial you replace X by little x, yeah, great. You go to the target value in the finite field. Is that okay? So if you understand this, well, since there is no real difference between x and y, I could also do it in the other direction. I could first replace x by f1 of y, and then replace big Y by little y, and still end up with the same value at the end. Okay? What does it mean? It means that given a finite field element which has been generated from this bivariate polynomial, I, I have two different representations of it. <coughs> I have one representation in terms of x and one representation in terms of y. 